Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zoom Into Wine. It's time for the show and your host, Ian Blackburn. Thank you, Ian, for having me very much. I appreciate it. And you, for everybody who is here tonight, I really appreciate the opportunity to get in front of you for a variety of reasons. But uh, Ian used a, a word at the outset that I think really makes sense for the wines that we're tasting today, especially this lineup and compelling was the word. And I absolutely agree with him, especially with this starting wine. Uh, it's, it's, it's extraordinary to really taste all of these different flavors of white wine together. And I don't, I'll be perfectly honest with all of you, I don't get an opportunity to do that, that so much anymore because uh, usually what I'm doing is focusing in on one particular area. So it makes this really an e intriguing prospect. So tonight, or at least what we're starting here is in the Western Loire Valley in France. And the Loire Valley is the longest running river in France, running basically from east, all the way in the east in the mountains, all the way to the west, where it empties out into the Atlantic. And- Paul, let me interrupt you for one second, just to make sure. If you check your email boxes, we spent a lot of time creating these beautiful materials for you. And there is a tasting mat that will guide you. To, I know your jars now have the labels on them. And if you are tasting with us at home, you might be tasting in the, with a little jar. We've put the little label on each one. Um, our little uh, wine Oompa Loompas do these amazing jobs putting these together. And um, we, uh, we packaged quite a few of them this week. But here's the lineup. There's even a beautiful brochure that you could print out and uh, see all of the, the different things. And I want to plant a seed as well. <clears throat> when we put this uh, brochure together, what we used is what's called the MSRP or the suggested retail prices for each of these wines. So you could see where, what they sell for either direct from the winery or internationally or in other states. But tonight, the people that are on this Zoom are going to have the absolute lowest price offered to you in the world and uh, you can even take a higher advantage of that because whenever you buy six or 12 any assortment on our website there's an additional discount you get to 12 bottles it's 10 percent off and of course uh, shipping is currently complimentary in los angeles and only ten dollars in los angeles in, uh, in california so uh, a lot of value all the way around and now paul there you get to talk about this beauty um, which I discovered a long time ago. Um, you know, I, uh, I was a big fan of this grape variety, going to oyster bars, and uh, I pretended to be an oyster bar at home over the last year, uh, shucking some oysters. And you go out and look for some, some muscadet. And I found a couple <clears throat> that, you know, there are some, there's, this category has a lot of very, blase kind of uninteresting versions just kind of i don't know utilitarian versions this is not utilitarian this is super exciting really cool and this is current vintage 2014. that is so awesome when wait till you just see the bottle you know you got something special in your hand when you hold this particular bottle because it's a you know, it's a it's a beautiful trophy type of uh, of a wine, and with that, Paul, why don't you take it away from me? Absolutely, thanks, Ian. You know, further to what I was saying at the outset, and we're, I think we'll we'll play this video in just a moment. I just wanted to give you a, a brief overview. As I was mentioning, this is on the very western end of the Loire Valley, and for those of you that haven't spent, any uh, I'm sorry, buddy. I, I, I That's was all right. That's okay. trying to get to the map. If we had it here, I thought we did. Yeah. If we can get over to that, and we'll, 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 I'll, we'll, I'll find one for us. So I don't think there is one here. Uh, it was only in the in the other brochure. Sorry about that. All right. And and I what there, I, there we go. I knew we had it there. There we go. Yeah. So if you look at where this uh, where where the river where the Loire River empties out into the Atlantic, you can pretty much guarantee cooler climate uh, as as the air moves into the river valley from the ocean in the evening. And this is one of the far west areas of France where they grow uh, uh, white grapes. And specifically, this Muscadet region is well known for very dry, uh, typically almost saline or salty characteristics. 
And as Ian said, there's a sea of uninteresting wine from the area because a lot of it also is co-op. And if you're not familiar with the whole concept of cooperative wines, it's where wine growers come together and they might sell their grapes to one larger kind of innocuous producer. And in the case of Ragotier, we're talking about a domain that has historically goes back a number of hundred of ye hundred years. And the Cuyo family, who you're going to watch a video from Amelie and her husband, they, uh, her, her father and two uncles purchased the property in 1979 and over, took it over, but it had been long existing for quite some time. The varietal, Milan de Borgone, is, is something that probably originated, as most people say, originated in Burgundy, but migrated here many, many years ago. It's a white wine grape that is, can be, as I said, very saline or salty, depending on the soils that it's in. And with, uh, with that in mind, I suppose that's the way we should probably watch the video. And then what I can do is give a little bit of detail on the wine itself that you're tasting. But think Muscadet, think uh, 29 to 31 months on the lees. And the lees, for those of you that don't follow this as carefully as some of us do, the lees are basically the spent le uh, yeast lees after fermentation, which tends to impart a creamier texture and character if utilized properly. Uh, as Ian said, this is a 2014 vintage, but why don't you taste while we run the video, if that sounds like a good idea, Ian, because that might be a good way to give people a little bit more to grasp onto. You betcha, and, and, and please do taste along. Uh, I'm Amélie, and this is my husband, Vincent. We are happy to welcome you at the Chateau de la Ragotière. So we are the two owners of the Chateau de la Ragotière Muscadet and the Bernier Wines. And we have the chance uh, to present you uh, a small visit of the winery. So we are very happy. Um, I, we hope you will have a lot of pleasure uh, watching this uh, little movie. So we will begin with uh, meeting Vincent uh, in his vines. Welcome in the vineyard. Uh, here we are on a, a plot of Muscadet, old vines, and uh, our stone uh, is with a schist, mecha schist, and uh, we we start a, a bioconversion in uh, 19. So all the soil are um, with a mechanical uh, work of the soil, and um, we will start the pruning. Uh, in the beginning of January in this part so uh, it's a nice period we are back again in the winery and we will come you come and visit the winery <laughs> so I like this area because you have like an atmosphere a classical atmosphere of a winery it's uh, also a place where um, after the harvest you have all the smell of the fermentation surrounding and it's um, just a very pleasant time here together with uh, visitors so this place is mainly con mainly contains barrels uh, but we also have uh, experimental um, uh, cuvées here and uh, last year we tried a new one of Muscadet uh, in this specific uh, tank it's uh, uh, ceramic eggs and um, it will give uh, a nice uh, richness to the Muscadet thanks to the movement of the lees, the circular movement and I also like a lot this place because you have a special design of uh, light from my dad who made that and makes this place special for me. We will um, continue the visit uh, with the um, bottling line because we have the chance to do everything here in the winery. Either uh, the Muscadet Chateau de la Ragotière bottling, but also uh, all the Bernier wines that we do here. Uh, um, uh, almost like it represents uh, uh, two days per week of bottling. So this is a classic bottling line. Especially uh, here, we have, uh, as you know, the screw cap closure for the Bernier wines and for the Muscadet black labels. And it's kind of unique to have it here. 
Now I want you to show you something very special that uh, not a lot of visitors can see. This is a very old cellar and uh, I will try to find the keys and after you will enter in it. I found the keys and something which will help me to open this cellar. So come with me. This place um, is empty, it's full of um, old vintage wine and it was um, here when my dad and uh, his brothers bought the Chateau de la Ravine. So you see the technique? To open it? Yeah. And now we just have to avoid the spiders. <laughs> you can come. Unfortunately, you won't have the chance to taste the wine just now, but if one day you come and visit me, um, I will ask you uh, the year of your, where you were born, when you were born, and uh, maybe we can find a bottle of the vintage of your birth date. We have a 62 here. Behind, behind you, you have 82, 84. So back in the winery, you have the classical one. Uh, so you can see here, there is some, uh, we call it underground tank, but uh, it's not underground this one, it's uh, from the wall and it's dated from 1929. And actually it's cement tank with glass tile inside. And here we are, we have Vincent, who is working. Okay, Vincent, what are you doing? We are just preparing a, a, a new bottling. So uh, this is Muscadet from uh, Ragotière numéro 1. And uh, here you can, you can see uh, the lid. On the bottom. On the bottom. The and just here, all the tart. Tart. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. The deepness of the um, tank is more or less uh, three meters. All the walls um, uh, is from schist soil. It's uh, exactly uh, the soil that we have uh, where our vines uh, grows. And um, all this building is very ancient building. It's dated from the 14th century, and uh, it's made from these stones. From one side of the road, we have the old part, and from the other side of the road, just in front, uh, we have the new part. It's a new building that we built four years ago, and it's very practical for us for all the, the put the label on the bottles and to have a stock of wine. It's kind of very noisy. Uh, inside, so I will just show you and then we will be back again outside. So it's um, the fact that it's new, it's very helpful for, uh, for people to work and also. It's much more easy to move the pallets and um, quite more. So this pallet is called Sweden. So last year we put this uh, nice sculpture in front of the winery and uh, if you
fantastic uh, tour of the winery um, and uh, really felt like I was there for a minute and um, really fascinating that the, the you saw the glass tiles with a tartaric accumulation and that's often what you would see it like sticking to the top of your cork um, if you pull open a bottle you see that it looks like little pieces of glass sticking to the cork that's tartaric or titratic acid uh, titrate sticking to the uh, to the cork itself they accumulate in cooler temperature um, wineries like this will take the temperature down of the wine until they solidify and then bottle them leaving those behind or filtering them out um, I don't I, I believe this wine is filtered so that that doesn't happen because this wine spends some time in refrigeration right there Paul yeah, it does so I, as I mentioned to you guys what makes this wine kind of intriguing especially compared to what we often face in Muscadet is it still retains that saline character but it also gets that creamy texture that you get from the the amount of time on the lees as i mentioned before we started the video and it, it makes for a, a richer rounder wine that still retains that acidity but at the same time it integrates rather nicely so you get this sense of of weight as opposed to real lightness and kind of uh, uh, chiseling acidity which tends to be something that is very common for the area one of the other things that was mentioned is in this particular bottling, what you're tasting, you probably noticed it says Valette on the, on the label. And Valette is basically since 2012, we'll call it effectively a sub appellation of the Muscadet Severin Seng uh, uh, appellation. So it is a larger appellation and they, uh, the, the, the powers that be uh, made a smaller sub appellation within the appellation as of 2012. So this all comes from this one commune of Valette. The other thing that was mentioned was schist soils. And for those of you that, uh, that like rocks, schist soils are typically of metamorphic origin. So they usually have to do with the you know, up upward movement of rocks. Shale is another one. And so this is not the classic uh, clay limestone soil. And for that matter, there are, um, there's, there is some river rock in, 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 because it's obviously near the river. But at the same time, it's a more of metamorphic origin. So it's very, very interesting soil and really, really fine for Muscadet uh, and specifically for Milan de Borgonia. So you capture both the essence of the cool air as well as the kind of marginal soils. And all of those combined, if you are patient, you can make some real interesting wine. So uh, back to the word compelling. That's what I find most interesting about, about tasting it. And as I said, or Ian mentioned, you're tasting a seven-year-old bottle of white wine that is both fresh and intriguing. And think about this with seafood, a lot of seafood, because you're right near the city of Nantes and the uh, ocean, and there's a lot of seafood combinations that are absolutely perfect. So with that, I guess I'll pass it back over to you. So, you um, uh, yeah, what yeah. questions might you have, folks? Go ahead. I wanted to show you something. Ah, Hubert. This is... Uh, can you see the vintage? Let me see you, Uber. Oh, there you are. I'm going to spotlight you. There so, we go. Ah. Paul was telling you that these these wines do, I mean, they do age not not so long. But we, the, when Amelie opened the, the cellar, the door the, the door of her old cellar, uh, these are the wines that are in there. So it's 1967 here. It's here great. You have, you have a 1959. Ah. Can you see it? Yeah, fantastic. It's, that's yeah. The, look at the color of the advancement. Here you have a 1955. Wow. Wow. And for some of you, <laughs> 1957. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> you can see the feel is really, really good. So uh, it's it's quite impressive. <laughs> I like the packaging too. That's cool. So we, we didn't send you samples of these, but uh, they're here. <laughs> Oh, so that's, cool. that's it, Jan. Go Thank ahead. you, Uber. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, and both uh, Paul and Uber work for the Im importer, and uh, we thank them for arranging for this wine to be here today. Um, really, really delicious and, and a great value. Price value is insane on these wines. So uh, you might want to grab a few and lay them down if you want to, because you can. I and, should mention that Uber and I have worked together for 20 years. 
Wow. No kidding. We're not used to each other. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well, I thank you both. And uh, what wonderful, wonderful lineup. Um, and we're going to say hi to our, our friends that are on the Zoom tonight. We've got people from all over the place. Uh, Lisa, thank you for being here in Santa Monica. Uh, I see my friends up in Napa Valley have joined us for tonight. Uh, Lauren Stalker down in San Diego. Miranda and your husband. Hi, guys. Good to see you. Um, Miranda just crushed our law school program, so thanks for joining us uh, right out of law school. Wendy, she's a, she works for a lawyer. Uh, our law school is uh, more of a wine school, but you do have to pass our bar exam, Wendy, our beverage aptitude review. And uh, so thank you guys for joining us. Ryan, how are you doing up there in the hills, buddy? I'm doing really well, and I'm really enjoying this. We got some ouzo um, marinated shrimp that we're going to be getting on the barbecue very soon. So That sounds pretty cool with this. Yeah, why not? That sounds fun. All right. Well, we will touch base with the rest of you in uh, in short term here. We're going to, Mike, is our winemaker able to make it? Did he ask you to fill in for him? Uh, he's here, but he has to take off in a couple minutes. So he might be starting and I'm finishing or uh, we're figuring out as we go. All right. Uh, All right. Get cool. back to the presentation. He'll uh, kick us off at least. Julian's here. All right, cool. Well, we'll, we'll get, we're going to get started. Let me find Julian. You're in, you're, you're actually uh, in harvest now or finishing up a, uh, kind of uh, production, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So we finished harvesting the grapes actually for this wine uh, about five weeks ago. So um, yeah, the vintage period's finished, which was uh, another exceptional one um, down here in New Zealand. We're very, very fortunate. Um, probably gone three years in a row that we've had um, perfect conditions for harvest. So um, very, very excited about the quality of wines that are going to come from 21. And, and as we were when we uh, when we had the 2020 harvest, which is what we're looking at tonight, I believe. Yes, sir. Well, <clears throat> I'm gonna pull up the slideshow and get us in there. Um, I wanna thank you for tuning in from New Zealand. Uh, what time of the day is it there? Oh, it's a very civil 2.30 PM actually. So um, probably a bit too early to, well, it's never too early, is it? So uh, <laughs> probably too early when I'm on work and there's people that can report back to uh, the powers that be. so. All right, all right. Well, let's, um, Go through. Mike did a great job today with our trade, um, and the wine kind of speaks for itself. This we're moving into wine number two, everybody. This is uh, called Craggy Range. Uh, we're down in Martinborough, New Zealand, with the winemaker Julian Grounds, and Mike Morietta is. Uh, I don't know if he's in Hawaii yet, but uh, his mind's always in the Hawaii a little bit. He's Hawaiian, <laughs> but he's here in uh, Southern California, the importer. And Craggy Range is just a spectacular spot. I've had the great fortune of being there myself. And um, uh, Julian, why don't you take us take us on a little journey here? Yeah, so, so looking at the map there, so um, Craggy Range, uh, we began um, planting in the late 90s, um, both in Hawke's Bay, which is there on the, the east coast of the North Island, uh, where we predominantly grow Syrah, Bordeaux varietals, uh, and Chardonnay, but then, at about the same time, we, we also um, investigated some of the great wines that were coming out of Martinborough. So um, principally Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc. So for those of you, I'm sure you're familiar with the the majority of Sauvignon from New Zealand comes out of Marlborough, which is there at the top, top end of the North Island. But whilst we did investigate that area, for us, there was, there was a really amazing character uh, in the, it probably described best as this kind of finesse and and liveliness and, and again we are a bit like the previous one we talked about the saline nature in that region of martinborough which is about an hour east of our nation's capital of wellington so it's very very cool as you can see i mean if we were to zoom back um you know we're not that far um up from the deep south and we really do cop those um those blistery cool winds even through the summer period so it is proper cold climate but the soils are perfect uh for Sauvignon blanc and the biggest point of difference, I suppose, and why in particular we went for this site in Martinborough, which is the, on the Tamuna Road in the Tamuna Valley, and that's where the name of this wine comes from, is that, yes, with, with Marlborough, there is, there is an abundance of, um, of fruit um, and, you know... Playing this video wine. underneath you, buddy. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, and, and I think the thing that we were really attracted to is we, we aspirationally saw that 
our Sauvignon was going to be drunk in, in, in not only um, uh, at home, but in the great restaurants of the world. And, and to have a wine that would be conducive to food consumption, even as a young wine, it needs to have a level of texture and complexity and, and vitality, um, other than just being pure fruit characters. So we saw that in the Martin Brewer wines. And, you know, I think they're, they're incredibly long lived in the mouth, but also do give you that, you know, that varietal character that people associate and, and why they've fallen in love with Sauvignon around the world. But you can see in the little stat sheet there, so this is actually just a one vineyard that this wine comes off um, that's about 20 years old now, but it's almost like assemblage. So I, got, I actually picked um, 20 different blocks to make this wine. And some of them, you know, some of them really give me this kind of phenolic backbone, others give me um, the acid and the others are pure fruit. And, and so all those all those blocks are really important for, for the blending stage in particular, but how I, how I do harvest them, the level of ripeness I harvest them. But then also what happens in the winery, there is a portion of barrel fermentation and, and a small portion of that receives new oak and then some stuff that, you know, some, some blocks that will go longer in lees. And, and ultimately for me, it's the, you know, year on year, I want to see the craggy baldy thread come out. And so that's, to do that, I need to have, um, you know, I need to have those special tools at play. And that's achieved by, by having these certain blocks that have got, maybe they've got different amounts of gravel in the blocks or they've got, a different amount of limestone because there is a bit of limestone in this vineyard um, down in the south uh, or their, their, their orientation and then it's in their trellising type you know we're looking at that actually a perfect photo there looking at the, the valleys that hug and form the uh, sorry the mountains that have hugged the valley and there's actually a, a river that would run in front of those vines um, in front of those pine trees there but you know we've got different aspects we've got some lyre trellis as well as some VSP to give us greater exposure and yeah, the potential alcohol is wine. We're always sitting that kind of 12 and a half to 13 and a half percent alcohol. And it's always got an amazing amount of freshness and um, vibrancy that comes through. But ultimately, I think year on year, this wine, it's, you know, it's one of the most important wines we do and, and the most, you know, important for the US market. We, do, we just want to see that craggy thread come through year on year. And I think that we, even when we have a warm vintage, I, I, on this site it is the abundance of freshness that really signs through which i think is new zealand you, you look at us on that map we're surrounded by ocean we're we're bobbling around there in the southern ocean just a little small landmass, and we can't really deflect any of those weather events and so what also makes us vulnerable is what makes us special i think that you know we, we always seem to to produce wines that um that lift that give lift and vibrancy yeah, that's a that's a really great shot actually looking at it going um going north to south there so most of the most of the vines running uh north to south and then uh running into wellington behind those and those actually those mountains are really important for for actually deflecting some of the weather because it is remarkably windy for those who've ever had the harrowing experience of actually landing a plane in wellington which um when the when the world opens up, we look forward to welcoming you all back there. But it's it's a pretty nightmarish experience with the wind. So those those, those mountains are really important, particularly in the flowering time, deflecting some of those those breezes and making sure that we do get a crop year on year. But in a, in effect, they also capture a lot of the cool air. So whilst we're vulnerable to fr frost and that makes us all nervous, it's during those kind of warmer summer months that it's that it's pivotal. Julian. Uh... Congratulations. This, this, uh, I've tasted craggy a thousand times over the last 20 years. I really believe that this 2020 may be the best rendition I've ever had. And oh, that's fantastic news. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and great to say in front of Mike too, because now he's going <laughs> <Right. laughs> now he's going to have a bit of bait. But yeah, I mean, yeah, it's really lovely. And, and I think for my, for me personally, it was kind of my second vintage there at craggy. So, uh, having a bit more experience with the fruit, but we've also got that benefit of vine age which you can never um, never downplay how important that is we're getting more and more intense in the grapes right here well it's just got this beautiful lift as you say and that again that saline that fresh air uh, those just drilling with incredible character and uh, no, there's nothing sweet about this wine too which a lot of New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs that come into this country in volume uh, kind of go in that direction and make them a little juicier, a little easier to love maybe. But this wine is just so refreshing and so clean and pure. But you also uh, manage to get just a little bit more richness too. And uh, I really, I just love the balance of this wine. It's just really in a great spot. And there, there, there is a great restaurant at this 
winery too i'm not sure if it's even operational right now julian but yeah absolutely actually i've just uh enjoyed a uh, work lunch there myself so um no, no, it's definitely fantastic. And um, yeah, really, really kind of you to say so. And it's a great point about the sweetness. I think that, uh, you know, sweetness is one of those things that probably leads to palate fatigue for a lot of people when, they, when they've when they like turned away from Sauvignon. So it's, you need to make sure that, you know, you, you encourage that level of flavor and richness by other means than sweetness. And I think for us, it's crop level, making sure that we're not trying to push these wines too much. We're, we're looking for, a lower crop level than what we set to the norm and and you know whilst the that might not be good for the um for your, your overall yield it's just fantastic for making sure that we've got that another level of quality that others may not have is there malolactic in this wine I well, you know like it's not a it's not a purposely encouraged process malolactic but uh, it is punching, there is about 15% that's punch and fermented, large oak fermented. And so, you know, the benefit of that is sitting on those leaves. And that's also why we use fermented that portion of it. Very good. Well, uh, a beautiful place. The traffic is terrible. Look at all the cars. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's not many of us down here, so you're all welcome. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. Uh, it's dramatic and cool. And I thank you for making time and get back there to the bottling and and keep doing what you're doing, man. Thank, thanks, guys. Thanks, you. And then I'm sure Mike will be able to answer any questions that you might have. I'll be here to answer any questions anybody has. Thank you so much for joining us, Julian. And thank you for everybody for joining us tonight. But I'll be here for the rest of the call if you guys have anything or need anything. I really appreciate it. Thanks again, Ian. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, Julian. Thank you so much. You like that, Ryan? I did. I did. The, the wine is drinking so good. <laughs> Sorry for his briefness, everybody. He's just in the middle of his work day and had to get back to making the rest of the 2021 vintage. So uh, I apologize, but I'll be here to help out with whatever I can. Uh, thank you, buddy. We were, I think we're, you've done a great job getting him here and for backing him up. I, I like the long lived in the mouth comment. <laughs> it really is true. It's got an amazing, it lasts forever. It's fantastic. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's a sign of, you know, quality. It's got some, you know, concentration there's some crunchiness here but there's also just enough richness and it's and it's not that sweetness it's not that residual or anything like that it's just wonderful concentration and and probably uh, that little bit of wood and that little bit of mallow and that it's, it's something bit. that a lot of new, most new zealand sal blancs are just all stainless steel very fresh bright delicious don't get me wrong but craggy range goes for you know a similar but a little different style they ages their wine with a little bit of oak on the leaves so it just adds a little extra richness a little extra texture to the wine but i think that's what helps with the length um and somebody wrote in the comments uh that just the fragrance is huge but then on the palate it's not as big and just has a little bit more to it and uh, i think it's beautiful and delicious and it's just the great wine making they do down there at craggy yeah, there's, there's this is uh in a in a blind exam, we call this a ringer. This wine just screams that it's from New Zealand because you're so far south and and it just, you know, makes this the, the smell of Sauvignon Blanc just scream from the gra glass in a very signature way, but uh, this in a higher quality um, approach in, in this particular rendition. Craggy is all estate. It's owned by a very wealthy family um that uh, really wanted to make a legacy they've got a what did you say michael a thousand, have a thousand year trust so the winery is basically owned by this trust for the next thousand years so it'll always be owned by the family and never be sold um all their wines are all the state as ian said and it's all uh single vineyard wines they do so it's really the biggest wine they make is this one that you have in your glass and to have a single vineyard sauvignon blanc be the one they just distribute around the world is pretty i don't know if there's very many very many other wineries that can say that Right. And they were actually the first winery in the Southern Hemisphere to make single vineyard wines. Mm -mm. Well, uh, again, uh, I, I'm not saying it just for the benefit of, of <laughs> the parents, but this is the best version of Craggy I've ever had. It's just tremendous. Mike, did this wine get any added press? Because it deserves We just got this wine in, so it hasn't, I don't think it's really had a time to get well, rated me. or scored yet, but it's, I, I agree with you. I had some this afternoon. It's phenomenal. You know, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, maybe on a good day, might get a 92, 90.3 point score, something like that. This is just, I'd love to see this push past that and really get touch that 94, 95 point, which is asking a lot for New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, but this, this definitely rings the bell for me. 
Greg, you can do it. I believe in him. <laughs> well, I guys, I hope you guys like it. And this wine is sub twenty dollars tonight for our group, uh, and just you know, that's a lot of wine for twenty bucks, as is the prior. So uh, keep those both in mind uh, just to find some amazing prices. All right, Mike, you're, you've done it, and I appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much. We are going to move on to uh, our third guest tonight. Thank and you, and thanks, everybody. You guys, you have a great night, sir. Thanks for all your help. Um, and if you want to hang out with us, you're welcome to, but uh, you were on all day with us, so we appreciate your, your efforts. Uh, Paul, we're, we're calling on you again, buddy. We're going back down to uh, South Africa now. So I appreciate that you guys are willing to follow me to a different continent. Uh, this is an interesting place. And uh, further to our exploration of white wine tonight, this is a very interesting place to land, at least for wine number three, because South Africa, take a look at it in one of two ways. It's either the oldest new world wine growing region in the world or the newest old world wine growing region in the world dating back to 1659. So uh, obviously very interesting place. There are a lot of uh, basically European varietals that migrated here on boats that came around the Cape of Good Hope and uh, were planted many hundreds of years ago. What we're seeing now is a, a how would I describe it? Post-apartheid, uh, um, there has been an influx of uh, dollars or, or, and as well as winemaking talent. Many winemakers that are now making wines here went to other parts of the world to make wine and came back here because of the outstanding climate in these very and varied climate. These, these are the oldest wine growing soils in the winemaking world, if you can believe that as well. And then you also have a lot of old vines just naturally that, were, that have for many years went into uh, cooperative brandy production uh, prior to 1990s. So net result of which is you have quality uh, uh, raw materials and quality winemaking talent. And what you're tasting here is one of the benchmarks of, uh, of, of wine in South Africa, specifically Schenenbach is what I'm referring to. And part of the reason is that you do see some old vines and what they call heritage, or there's an old vine project that actually has uh, been run by a, 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 a woman who's very well known for searching out uh, old vine vineyards and making sure that they don't get uh, uprooted and replanted. And this is uh, what you're tasting is one of those, it's actually a blend of two old vine heritage vineyards that make up this wine. They were planted in the early 1970s. Um, we're going to run a quick video, and Johan Reinecke is the, is, the, is the owner and founder of this winery, which is located in Stellenbosch. And for those of you that are less familiar with Stellenbosch, uh, think about uh, this map here. You can see where the arrow is that's coming in off of False Bay. And for those of you that enjoy Shark Week uh, and Nat Geo, uh, Shark Week is where you see those, uh, there's often sharks that are breaching the ocean in search of or, or chasing seals. Well, it all takes place in False Bay. At least that's where they tend, tend to show it every year. And so I this got, is- I got something even more uh, topical. My octopus teacher, right yes. there. Right there. Right there. That's yeah. right. You got it. You got it. You got, you got, so you if got you look at this, it's perfect. It's perfect. Stellenbosch is just inland off of the ocean. So a combination of cool breezes and just to the very eastern part of Stellenbosch is a mountain range as well. So uh, net result is you have cool afternoons and warm days. Uh, Ian, I didn't know if you wanted to run the video now as everybody sure. is taking, you can kind of follow along the same way that we did before. And then I'll give yeah. some information about the wines, okay? Or the you wines. Betcha. You betcha, and I, I, I want to tell you there is a, there's a lot of great Chenin Blanc producers in South Africa um, and we, you know, weighed over a few different options, but this is an again one of those places that I've been to, that I I fell in love with the quality of this wine year after year. There's again a richness and added weight to these wines because of quality winemaking, quality production. This is not the five dollar inexpensive South African white wine that comes in. Um, they also call these wines Steen, by the way, but they this is just an added level of attention to detail 
and uh, you're gonna love this wine with an amazing uh, meal. Hi everyone, I'm Johan Reinecke from Reinecke Wines. We're at Reinecke Wines Farm in Stellenbosch. It's a beautiful day as you can see. Sun is shining, uh, cows are calving, the vines are growing. It's absolutely a lovely time of the year. Uh, very special to share it with you. Would be first prize if I could have you on the farm, but we're going to do our best to take the farm to you today. Um, I was lucky enough to come here about 30 years ago. And as a student, I worked in some of the vineyards and I also did a degree in environmental ethics. And the combination of the two convinced me that um, going organic and biodynamic was the right thing to do. So what that means from an organic point of view is that we don't use any herbicides or pesticides or fungicides on our farm. And from a biodynamic point of view, we take things a step further and try and shift the needle from being purely sustainable to becoming self-sufficient. Um, one does that by creating synergies between multiple organic systems. So we have vines, as you can see we also have these beautiful cows here. Cows don't have numbers, they have names, uh, they're amazing animals. They, they're absolutely key for the fertility of the farm and it's such a pleasure to work with them. One of the best pieces of advice that I ever got was to, if you have a dream, is to surround yourself with people who are better than you. And I was given this when I was in my early 20s and I took it to heart. And I think uh, today is a great opportunity to meet these people um, and see who and what is behind Renica Wines. Because, you know, I think the wines are beautiful. They're fresh, they're alive, just like the farm is. And everything here plays a role but the people do as well. So enjoy it, uh, come and visit as soon as you can, and thank you so much for the support. Cheers. My name is Isha. I'm the biodynamic farmer on Reinecke Wines. The vineyards are handled in a very biodynamic way, um, and the soil is treated in a very biodynamic way, uh, and it all starts off here in the uh, compost area. Our vineyards, our pasture lands, our grain fields, all of these are treated with our biodynamic compost heaps. So there is very careful attention to the constellations, to the planetary uh, movements, to the sun and the moon, um, because all of those influence the soil and influence plant life as well as man and animal. Um, and all of that I have to pay attention to so that when I apply compost it's done at the right time. The idea then is to produce the highest quality grape that one can possibly produce. My name is uh, Rudiger Gretschel. I am kind of in charge of everything wine on Reinecke Wines. I remember when I initially came here I was kind of you know, struck by, by, this, by this unbelievable place um, on top of the Polka Dry Hills where Reinecke Wines is situated. Um, like every winemaker, the kind of the holy grail is to make a wine that is that is that is unique. You know that um, nobody else can reproduce. You know that's that's the one beauty about wine, and uh, it's all of these things. You know the type of soil, the climate, the microclimate, the vines, the age of the vines, even um, the winds and the radiation. All of these things come together and uh, they give you a certain taste in the grapes and it's this taste which we try to put into the bottle of wine in order to make something that can taste truly uh, truly unique or truly Reinecke. Um, my name is Ishka, I'm the winemaker at Reinecke Wines. I think what I try and strive to do at Reinecke Wines is really just showcase the amazing fruit that we have on the farm and try and showcase that in the bottle and each vintage. After 20 years of farming biodynamically, there's equilibrium which has been achieved on the farm, which produces fruit that is completely balanced and allows for minimal intervention due to low pH, high acidity, and just a healthy ferment to occur naturally. So it might seem that the job is easy. I guess a lot of you might think that, but um, there's a lot of pressure to make sure that it all showcases beautifully and that the product is a beautiful product and bottle. 
Hi, my name is Lazon and I've started working for Renica Wines in 2015. Um, I'm the office administrator. I do the admin, I run the testing room, um, I run the online sales as well. Renica Wines has been a part of my family for quite some time. My dad used to work for Renica Wines, my mom used to work here. My dream was always to become a part of something bigger and we better to be than Renica Wines. So. It's amazing working here. Uh, we are a very small team, but we have become m m like family, so I enjoy it very much to work here. Hi everyone, um, I'm Dan. I'm the operations manager at Renica Wines. What my role mainly comprises of is being in charge of secondary production. So that means once the wine is in bottle, I take over, making sure the wine gets labeled correctly for all different clients gets uh, packaged in boxes and that um, the orders go out, the correct wine goes out to the correct people and to the correct clients. Um, I also handle all the orders domestically and internationally. Um, yes, so I have to be very specific about that. Um, so yes, guys, let's make it happen. Place your orders. I'm ready for you. Yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying what's in the glass. I don't think you're seeing my screen right now, so I'm gonna get you back in there. But uh... so I, I wanted to mention something that for those of you that might find this, you know, comparable. This is this is an indigenous white grape bridal from the Loire Valley that was uh, transplanted to South Africa. And uh, the net result is they are making some world-class white wines from Chenin Blanc in South Africa. There's not a lot of places where you get world-class uh, Chenin Blanc, uh, Loire Valley being one, of course, the original place. So for those of you that are familiar more with Chardonnay, but you want to try something that has the kind of texture and power and richness, and for that matter, acidity, this is a great alternative and Chenin Blanc uh, is it has a tendency to be very very uh, uh, versatile with food, obviously with white with 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 fish and but it also with chicken. I'm sure if Hubert uh, is is on here, he could probably comment on some other Loire Valley dishes because he's originally from the Loire. Uh, it, it is a, a, a again for this for me this wine is a spectacular expression of what makes South Africa intriguing. Per what what Ian had said earlier. And these cows are beautiful too, by the way. They are gorgeous. Not so, yeah, not so good. Uh, definitely your goat cheese, uh, yeah. your chev would be so good with this wine. I'd like, um, I'd like to say something here, uh, just a previous, the previous slide, Ian. Oh, sure, sure. What do you got? Um, right. Well, you see this, this, it's organic farming, not this one, the one with the vineyard. It's organic farming. So you see a, uh, no, another one with the vineyard. You see a lot of grass growing in the vineyards, like this one, exactly. Mm -hmm. Too often, uh, when you when you drive around, you see vineyards with vines, and and on the on the ground you see the soil, but nothing else. In this case, you have a bunch of plants and flowers growing with the vine, and I, I think this is a beautiful vineyard. When it's too clean, you know they are using herbicides to 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 clean the ground and kill all the weeds. In this case, you don't. You have all of these beneficial flowers growing and plants, and it's very healthy. This this uh, this vineyard is has life. When you see these beautiful, I mean, these other vineyards that don't have anything, it's it looks good, but it doesn't have any life. Well, they're definitely putting the effort in there, and uh, yeah. the composting and uh, the you know the weather down there is. Um, you know, it's fairly similar to weather like we would have. I mean, it's a very coastal influence yeah. and, and, um, and, you know, lots of sunshine, but a good amount of rain and, and obviously the, uh, the ecosystem there is just really fragile and, and important part of the mixture. So, um, I, the, kudos to the winemaker, to the owner for, uh, having such great ethos and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that wine. I, I, I struggled a little bit, I'll be honest, uh, putting these first three wines in order, but I think I got it right. Um, the, 
the this, this this has just a little heavier body weight in the mouth and and that creamy texture is just really really delicious Shannon whether it's from Vouvray or uh, Sauvignon or down here from uh, uh, South Africa is one of my favorite grapes to, to work into the, the evening. I always have a good value proposition, and uh, this one is just exceptional. It's at the top of the uh, top of the charts, top of the class. So, thank you guys for allowing us to do that. And and I don't mean to tap on the door too often, but we stay in your neighborhood as we go back to France, and we found uh, that Weinbach is in your portfolio also. So. Uh, we really nailed it with three top, top wines. And folks, if you have enjoyed what you've tasted so far, we are only halfway done. And uh, you, you don't, don't uh, start picking favorites yet. Because we're going into Alsace and Alsatian wines should never be uh, forgotten or uh, left off the list. This is this is a really really important brand. And Paul, why don't you take us into it? No, no question. It is a it is a great great wine growing region and one of the greatest in the world in my mind. It, it's a bit of a I would describe it as a bit of a banana belt of sorts in France. It does get quite warm here in the uh, summertime. Even given its location in France, if you look, it's in Northeast France. So you would think it'd be a lot cooler, but it's well sheltered. And if you look at the, 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 the hills that run north to south and the small towns that you see, uh, Domaine Weinbach is located in, right in the town of, or right around the town of Kaiserberg, which you'll see if you uh, look at the arrow or the name, it's right uh, below Rivoble. Uh, there's a small valley that runs from uh, west to east and empties out on the plain there into the, uh, you, you know, and you see the German border. And uh, they're looking at the location for, of the property, which is known as, if you look on the label, Clos de Capucine. And why it's interesting is because the Capuchin uh, monks originally founded that property, and it was in the early 1900s that the, uh, this, the Fowler family took over this property. So they've had this uh, north of a hundred years or so. Um, why it's important is this is one of the great domains in Alsace. Uh, and why is it interesting? They are uh, estate driven, family run, and very much uh, uh, an embodiment of the vineyard brands uh, of family uh, ownership um, estates. Uh, Hubert is obviously even, since he's been with Vineyard Brands even longer than I have, a lot longer if you can possibly believe it. Uh, he's been to this property so many times it almost embarrasses me, but uh, I will tell you it's one of the great and gorgeous properties to, to visit. It's surrounded by an old clove and what you are tasting is older vines, Pinot Gris from within the walls of the clove. Um, uh, Pinot Gris is a kind of an interesting grape variety because you've, you've probably heard of it in other uh, iterations, but in Alsace, you get an uncommon richness, but also acidity and a very, well, I often describe it as a slight pear quality that tends to come through in the mouthfeel when you have a, an opulently textured ripe version, but still with nice firm acidity. And this is a 2018. Uh, vintage, which I do think has absolutely lovely aromatics, and at the same time, it is finishes very, very well. So if you look at the clo, you know you can kind of barely see the uh, the, the walled-in part, but this comes from the inside of the wall, right? right, there, right? right? Yeah. Wall. And right outside of the wall, if you just go to the, I guess it would be going just to the north, but facing south and southeast is the Grand Cru Schlossberg, which is gran granitic in origin. Most of this would be decomposed granite pebbles and silt down in the Clos, which is in the valley part, but still uh, uh, um, uh, very, very marginal soils, but the right type of soils for Pinot Gris and for Riesling. Um, this is a domain that I would, I mean, if you ever have a chance to go to Alsace, it's an, un an unbelievable visit. 
uh, they are always very gracious to have you. And what they tend to uh, uh, emphasize are the three great white grape varietals that they grow there, of which this is one. So Pinot Gris, uh, Gewur Gewurztraminer. Talk right over the top of it. That, well, what I might suggest is as, we're, as I'm talking further, I'll give you a better idea as to what you're actually seeing here. So this is the property itself and the inside, inside of the clo. Um, this is a property that I'm, I can't tell you how proud I am to represent the main Weinbach. And part of the reason for that is their attention to detail. Hubert had mentioned earlier when we were talking about South Africa and uh, biodynamics, uh, Domain Weinbach follows a similar path in that they're biodynamic as well. Uh, extraordinary attention to detail both in the vineyard and also in the cellar. Uh, everything happens very naturally there in that going back to the uh, a comment about Schlossberg as a vineyard, they harvest the various parts of Schlossberg that they own at different times. So the top which it becomes the Riesling Schlossberg and the dry bottling, harvested at a different time from the holding that they have in the middle of the vineyard, which is halfway down, and, that, and the holdings that they have at the bottom of the vineyard. So uh, they're, they're, as I mentioned, attention to deal, detail is second to none. Um, uh, to, you're seeing uh, some of the Fowler family. I think it was uh, Catherine was uh, in walking around the vineyard. Uh, Teo and Eddie are her sons. The three of them are currently running the uh, the, the, the property, and uh, uh, um, uh, Catherine's mother Colette, uh, who passed away some five years ago or so, she was running the property uh, prior. So they have a, a long history of doing things in a very very uh, sustainable, but in this case biodynamic way. They do make some red wine, Pinot Noir, but for the most part, they've been a benchmark for white grape varietals. In, it's probably Pinot Gris right there, right? It looks like it from the color. Yeah. And if you look at your glass of wine right now and you look hard enough, you can actually see that shade of, of pink in the uh, white wine uh, coming from the skin. Um, this is also an extraordinarily uh, impressive place to eat for those of you that like to eat occasionally. And if you ever visit Alsace, uh, it's, it's a place where you see game birds and you see uh, uh, a foie gras and you see rich foods. Uh, you, you see foods that have even a German origin because of its location and its uh, history as a place that both France and Germany have, have battled over, over over the centuries. But it's a very, very intriguing, very interesting place from the perspective of grape varietals that you wouldn't taste so much from the south. Uh, if you go into Burgundy in the south where Chardonnay is predominant, or if you go into Loire where Sauvignon Blanc and Chenin are. Uh, I, I, I don't know if Hubert wants to add anything, but I always find myself so enthralled by the aromatics and the actual texture of these wines. And I'll be honest with you, for all the years that I have been uh, uh, showing these wines, I still don't get to taste them enough. I still don't. <laughs> So, uh, anyhow, um, the, uh, we're, we're kind of we, we've cut out the, the we've cut out the the sound here, but it gives you a better idea as to what they're all about. Um, they're a small producer, Hubert. I don't know if you want to tap into the actual production side at this point because uh, they're not that large, but they tend to make mm -hmm. a lot of small cuvées. And I would they, add they produce about uh, ten thousand cases of wine, but it's it's. Uh... They, they put, with these 10,000 cases, they actually have maybe 20 different cuvées, different uh, ripeness, dryness. Uh, it is really one of the best estates in Alsace and really one of the best estates in France. Yeah. Uh, it, it is a beautiful place. Uh, uh, and as Paul said, we are very proud to be uh, importing these wines. We've been importing them for for maybe 50, 50 years or so in the US. And these are at the, again, at the top of the, of the charts. Uh, you know, when I have, uh, going back to the last wine we were tasting, um, I had some friends here from South Africa on a Zoom recently, and I showed them my South African wine selection, and the, they mentioned how much they love the uh, Reineke. Uh, and 
then uh, I've had people look at our Alsatian selection and and Weinbach is just like you know the trophy of Alsace and the the, the, the vineyards that they own and the way that they execute and that, that also it is shown in the prices that they can get for the wines which is considerably more than other producers and so uh, we again have a special treat tonight with this wine being at an exceptional price um, these uh, and I will say that Alsace is having a moment um, uh, the you know the, maybe it's the dollar the the tariffs the the challenges of importation but a lot of uh, Alsatian brands have been taking uh, considerable price gains and it's very, getting uh, the categories jumped up I'd say 20 percent or so in an average price point over the last year or two and and it's about time these wines are the same price I was buying them 20 years ago and so these these uh, should all all Alsatian wines should be considerably more expensive because of what goes into them and how long they age. These things are giants and they can, they can, I mean, seriously, you can keep them in your cellars with great confidence for decades. And uh, uh, this is this, this particular version, 2018, while it was a tough vintage for a lot of reasons, um, it made great wines great wines it was a very dry summer and the quality that came out not the quantity but the quality that came out in 18 is exceptional and so this is going to be a highly recommended uh wine to drink and enjoy now but also to put some down and uh oh, some people come to me and they say i need some birth year wines uh i want to put down some wines and I, I just throw out there all the time. I say, if you want one of the great values to put down in your cellar for someone to turn 21, and they're going to open a bottle when they're 21 and, and hopefully like it, I think Alsace could be a great option for that because uh, 20, 20 years in stride. Absolutely. Here we go. If wine making family. Are they twins? No. <laughs> Pretty close in age, no? Uh, if they're what? <laughs> I don't know. Three, they're, very, they're, they're about three years in age difference, something like that. Yeah. I thought maybe. And that's a, another good thing about um, Domaine Van Back is that they do not use any new oak at all. So when you test these wines, you really test the grape, uh, Riesling, Gewurztraminer, Pinot Gris, Sylvaner. Uh, you really test the grape. Um, something that is changing a little bit there is that now they are making a Pinot Noir also. And with the uh, with, uh, weather getting warmer every year, um, for the past few years, um, they are able to make some Pinot Noir that, are, that have good concentration. And they used to be very light Pinot Noir wines, but not anymore. Hmm. So that's a new thing there. Beautiful. And it is dramatic there. Um, I've I've been caught in in a storm there, and it, 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 it could change, like literally overnight. A uh, blanket of snow came through. Nothing was moving. The next day, it was uh, pretty dramatic. It was gorgeous. Well, guys, thank you very much for your time, and uh, for all the great wines that we just were able to pick. Uh, uh, we we only have twelve great wines in this entire series, and. And it's easy to find uh, a number of other possible wines inside the Vineyard Brands um, portfolio. I will say sometimes when you're in a store, you might, uh, as, your, as your wine adventures may continue in life, just turn around the bottles and see who's importing the, the wine. And when you see Vineyard Brands on the back, you're probably looking at an incredible story. Um, they really have some of the best in every every part of the world, and uh, it's like a you know, I, I, your your wine um, portfolio really is like a a, 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 a major three star Michelin wine list, uh, you know, waiting to happen. So I uh, thank you guys for letting us uh, involve uh, some of these great uh, beauties, and we hope that we uh, um, become a really big client for you this year as uh, we intend to carry these 
um, for a long time. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, we uh, we move on into wine number five, and we're going to Napa Valley, and we, we've got a phenomenal, diverse lineup of wines tonight, moving all over the world. Both nights are going to be that way, um, and like I said, I struggled with the order of how to put things and where, but um, I think you'll see this is a just a beautiful. Viognier that's we're going to be talking to Boguet sellers now and uh, visiting the Napa Valley. So welcome Boguet. Yeah, okay, where there you? you go. There you are. How's it going? Oh, you're together. There you are. Okay, good. I was trying to figure that out. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. We made it easy on you, Ian. Uh, thank you. How's it going? <laughs> Fantastic. Good to see you. And thanks so much. I've been watching the brand for years. You guys have been involved with us. Um, many times in the past decade so thank you for coming back and seeing us and, yeah. and being involved so I, I my name is Tim Ennis and uh, this is Tom Bogetz. Uh Tom is the winemaker and owner and I'm the sales manager and we're just kind of chilling right now after a very long uh, interesting day of bottling oh. um, so we have been sweating and working <laughs> very hard all day all day together with our very, very small crew of people. So uh, uh, we specialize uh, in some fantastic Bordeaux blends, but uh, today uh, what you have is a V and A. Um, uh, do you, you want to talk about it? Sure, sure. <clears throat> so uh, for the majority, you're probably aware, V and A is a grape that is uh, based out of uh, the Northern Rhone region. Um, and it grows actually very well here in, in uh, California in certain areas, uh, Central Coast, it does very, very well. And there's some nice pockets here in um, uh, both Sonoma and Napa that uh, do pretty well. This wine in particular comes from a really neat uh, uh, vineyard source up on Mount Veter. So if you're looking at the map here, you, you can see Mount Veter is actually the uh, lowest or most southern part of Napa Valley with elevation. So this vineyard is actually around uh, about 1300 feet above the valley floor. Uh, so what's nice about that is it's above the, uh, the, the fog line, which, you know, with the, our proximity to uh, San Pablo Bay or San Francisco Bay, every, every morning we have this heavy fog that rolls in and it peels back over uh, as the day heats up. This vineyard sits above that all day long. And what's nice about that is we get this really, really nice crisp minerality out of the uh, uh, Viognier. Um, never get any kind of funkiness. You get the notes that you would expect. So if you're familiar with Viognier from, especially from Northern Rhone, the Condru region where this really is a, a major focus, you expect to get um, some really nice uh, stone fruit notes. You know, you're looking for apricots, you're looking for maybe some pears, but definitely peaches. And this vineyard that you're looking at is at the source of it. Um, and you can see we're, we're actually looking down the uh, block where this uh, vineyard comes from towards the town of Napa Valley. So it, it's, it's pretty far down. Um, uh, what I love about this this wine, though, year in and year out, is it's just the freshness that comes off of it, the the stone fruits that you you get out of it, without a lot of alcohol or a lot of heavy weight, you know, uh, to it. You know, Napa, we're blessed with a lot of sun here, so we have no shortage of of ripening our fruit, um, and obviously with that you can get some you know higher alcohols. This wine usually clocks in somewhere in the low 14s uh so it's not overly uh uh alcoholic um what i do generally when i make this it's done in uh neutral french oak so usually used barrels and i'll roll in maybe about uh 25 to 30 percent in stainless so prior to bottling about a month out i'll, I'll blend between the uh, the wine that comes through um, oak 
with the stuff that's in uh, stainless and try and find that that happy medium where we really have those stone fruits show out um, as, as well as they can. Um, other than that, uh, Ian, do you have any thoughts on that? You know, um, I got to tell you, I picked this wine because it, it this is like, uh, uh, if you're a, if you want a white wine for a red wine um, drinking fan, this is like a red wine, or, you know, it's got drama, depth, um, <clears throat> it's uh, volume, power, concentration, there's aromatics, obviously, but uh, really a, a dramatic and cool, big, powerful uh, white wine. And I think you really bring something special. Not a lot of places um, will you see single vineyard Viognier from the Napa Valley made in this style. It's just, this is just a really special. It's kind of like Tom, like you're, you're describing Tom kind of <laughs> funny way. Well, yeah. you. <laughs> you, you definitely put a great formula together to bring uh, some personality to not only your you know rendition of Viognier, but to Viognier overall, because there's so many light, just subtly floral. I mean, this has got so much character and so much complexity. Um, I get ginger, I get flowers, I get uh, yeah. just, it, it makes me hungry. Yeah, no, I, and it is that it's, for me, this is the wine when I when I need to pair something with that that Asian influenced uh, cuisine, which I love. Uh, whether it's Thai, whether it's Indian, you know, generally you want something a little sweeter, uh, you know, like a nice Riesling that's off dry. This is my rendition where it's it actually is a dry wine, but the aromatics, you know, the mid palate, you know, will really trick you and think you, oh, this is going to be kind of sweet, bone dry on the finish, which you expect. Um, but it's because of that, it's great with food. Um, I loved your analogy also, because my wife uses that same term. This is, this is kind of a red wine drinker's white wine because it, it has that complexity, that, that weight, that interest on the mid palate that red wine drinkers seem to love, but it's a white wine that, and if you sit back and just enjoy it in your glass, it's pretty interesting and it will get interesting, you know, 15 minutes later or 20 minutes later as those aromatics kind of open up. We focus on red wine. I mean, I, I, and our, our, our major focus is is Bordeaux blend, uh, uh, um, you know, Cabernet based or, or sometimes. Tom's, Tom's been featured at our Stars of uh, Cab and uh, Stars of Napa as well in yeah. past years, many years at the peninsula. Yes, we we have some. Fat, I mean, Tom makes some really good red wine, um, and that's why I came a part of this uh, this uh, organization. But uh, but particularly today, we're talking about white wine, and uh, we're talking about the VNA that we have available. But you know, when you go to our website, uh, bogetsellers.com, you can find everything that you might be interested in. And I think you're going to like everything that you find. Well, the good news, too, is that everyone here is probably itching to go and visit somebody. And you guys are the only winery we've tasted so far that you can go and visit. <laughs> yeah, we're that. And we're at the, we're at the tasting. We're here. Yeah, <laughs> after, as, as Tim mentioned, we, we bottled all of our 2020 whites today. There's Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Chardonnay, uh, Viognier, um, as well as other wines today. And literally, we went straight from the winery over here to get set up so you know it's been a long day but uh, we're looking forward to talking about white wine but when you do come up here we have music going and it's fun and we're it's educational um so come and see us uh it's a great place to visit um, that's where we are right now that's where we're sitting right now there you go all right yeah, yeah. so come on up to napa and come and see us we'd love Definitely to see you in, uh, friends. yeah i, I look forward it's to talking to with you, you again man it's been a while and uh, yep. the wine world just, it, it's that way we, we, we lose track of each other for a couple of years and we get back together. So I'm you so bet. happy to see you both. Good seeing you, Ian. Thank you both very much. Cheers. And thank you guys. Uh, the, this Viognier is rocking and it's, uh, and it's bringing us to a bigger and bigger crescendo 
Um, and uh, so we're now we're going to go into one of my favorite Chardonnay producers, and we're going to taste Daylinger. All right, nice. Cool. Have you guys ever tasted Daylinger before? Have been on that side of the fence? I have. Yeah, I mean, it's the kind of wine that we all, you know, we, we all get in the wine business and we we have a certain level of, uh, you know, appreciation for for the different wine and and mm -hmm. the Daylingers uh, have earned their uh, their their reward. They've been in the business for a long period of time and they've they've uh, planted and had good timing. They planted in the right soils at the right place back in the 1970s and they grew this brand uh, the hard way and uh, dedication and consistency and a little bit of stubbornness and so right now we're up in the Russian River Valley and we're looking at uh, these Gold Ridge soils they call and they, that's what they, they, they saw when they planted the vineyard and they have this great place and 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 in um, this textbook spot that makes great Pinot and great Chardonnay. Um, so as you put this in the glass, I want to taste it with you. <clears throat> and uh, we've been trying to pull off a little bit of a, a computer miracle here to get this video working that we made with Eva Dellinger. And if I don't get it working tonight, I'm going to send it to everybody. Um, that's on the video so you can watch it with me but she is now running the winery and she is a really highly educated and intelligent uh, a member of the family who is now operating the Daylinger brand this is her on the right and that's her father Tom and uh, the whole the whole crew and they have this these incredible soils that they're able to make these incredible wines with uh, Two months ago, maybe four months ago, featured on the cover of the Wine Spectator. 2018 Pinot Noir was selected as one of the top wines of the year. Um, and, but the Chardonnay, it got an even higher score. And so uh, that's what we're showing you tonight is 2018 Dalinger. I have both the 17 and the 18 on my website. Um, and probably uh, I would. I'll have a 19 and a 20. Yeah, if I can have a vertical of these wines, they really age gracefully. And Ava's doing a great job running the ranch. Here's a here's a look at the property. This is a sizable property, and they do use now almost all the fruit that they grow. But they have had times where they sold some fruit. Here's a look at some Chardonnay. And just, you know, when you're making great wine, you're going to do things in the vineyard and you've got these old vines and you're going to train the vineyard to focus on quality. And so you can see here the number of clusters per cane. It's regimented and they've trained the vines to grow the fruit in what they call the fruiting zone. And then you're going to get uniformity of ripeness uh, because they're all in that same sweet spot. The looking for a message from my team to see if they got that video for me. I'm not seeing it, so I'm gonna have to punt. Um, but uh, let's take a look at the wine together in the glass. Um, oak barrel fermentation, French oak, 25% new. Uh, when you smell it, you know, Chardonnay should smell like apple and pear. And then you're going to get that complexity from thyme and wood. Also soil type. And what I like about this wine is it balances the wood, the fruit, the earth. And I think you can smell more... Uh, baked apple, bruised apple um, kind of notes in the wine. As it gets a little bit older and older, that, that type of aroma will continue to advance and then the wood will really integrate. You get maybe a little bit of a, a, a hint of butter, but it's not super buttery, but it is got that nice oak and butter component.
the creaminess, the vanilla, creme brulee, the mouth filling. I mean, this is just a wonderful wine to sit around and drink on its own. Um, I mean, incredible with a piece of fish or grilled chicken or something like that, of course. But, you know, if you want a textbook, high quality California Chardonnay, it competes with the greatest in the business. This is the brand I trust. I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to get this wine from the winery. Not every retailer gets to do that. They do focus on restaurants and they, because of the lack of restaurants that they could focus on, maybe it was my turn to ask that question. But I bought these wines back in the early 1990s um, when I worked at Checkers, sold them at Patina. I've had them in, in, in other restaurants that I consulted on. And uh, now I get to sell them in my own store. I have both the Chardonnay and the Pinot. I'll continue to build library on these wines. And if they go, go back and offer me some older wines, I'm, I might have, be able to get some of those as well. But this is, uh, I think, dollar for dollar. The, the other thing I like about Dellinger is when a brand gets hot and they get popular, they continue to go up in price and they start leaving this kind of comfortable zone. This wine has not really changed price. In fact, it may have come down in price over the last 10 years. And in fact, this wine was sold just to restaurants and just to uh, tasting room visitors and mailing list. And one of the big changes now is that a few places like me are able to sell it. So, um, you know, for a brand that's 40 years old and has a top reputation to be less than $40 a bottle is, is really, really amazing. Um, and that's where this wine is. 95, 96 points, Wine Spectator under 40 bucks a bottle. There's not very many brands that can pull that off and they do it uh, with class and style and they only focus on these two wines. This is the Chard and the Pinot from Daylinger. And it's pronounced Daylinger, by the way. I, I, get, I get this uh, uh, almost Pavlovian thing going through my mind where I, if I say it wrong, I get smacked. Uh, it's Daylinger. Any comments? How's that? How's that wine treating you? This is my favorite one with my ouzo shrimp. Oh wow! Cool. <laughs> it's fantastic, Ian. I really love it. Really yeah. good. Me too. Me too. Michael, I saw some nice head shaking up there of the Visconti Visconti family. There, you guys are enjoying. I just, I probably just muted you as you hit that button. Sorry. Thank you, Michael. I can hear Excellent. you. Excellent. Thank you. Choices. Uh, our cup runneth over. I have my own picks, but I think it's influenced by my own palate. I'll let Corinne express hers. Corinne, what did you think? Oh, I, I loved it. I, I like the bouquets the best. All right. That's my favorite. Who gets? Are you guys still here? We'll have to let them know. Uh, for me, it was, uh, I don't want to overspeak. Uh, I can't even remember the last time I enjoyed any Chenin Blanc. Mm. <laughs> and this knocked it out of the park. So I put it in the one to three category for me. Um, the Sauvignon Blanc from Craggy Ridge. We didn't get the memo. Uh, so we started drinking it prior to this ah, instruction. I see. Got a little head start. And hardly any is left. So that <laughs> can tell you something about that. Uh, so that's in our top three, uh, at least mine, I should say. And I really appreciated uh, the Bogut's uh, family member uh, going through the aroma, the pairing with cuisine type. Uh, and the finish. Uh, of course, we're prejudiced because our palates are from the Bay Area, which includes Napa and Sonoma. So that was my third pick, the Yong Ye. Nice. Uh, from Thank Bogus. you very much. That's great. I'm glad you liked them. 
And uh, Terry Kamali, you've got a little group over there. Are you guys, uh, you guys look like you're talking about something else. And Dillenbach, how are you? Fantastic. This was great. Cool. I'm, in, uh, I'm in Chicago and uh, I was really, yeah, I was, I was enjoying the different, um, all of them. I think I particularly enjoyed the uh, Craigie and the Ranicky. Nice. Yeah, and the, and the last one, Dalen. You said Dalen, Dalinger? Dalinger, yeah. Dalinger. I guess, I, I I think of what I was saying for years before it was Dellinger, and it's Dalinger. Yeah, don't mess that one up. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they'll correct you. And Michael Dellenbach is on the Zoom too. Where are you, where are you sitting, Michael? I'm in Torrance, California, and I've got oh. I've got both my uh, daughters on the Zoom call. Far out, A so, plus for you. So uh, Anne is in Chicago, and Marcia's in Del Mar, and so uh, looking for Marcia. So, so anyway, we've enjoyed the, all the whites. Where I'm I'm predominantly a white drinker, not so much a red. All right. Um, and I really enjoyed the the first first three and then the Chardonnay at the last was really, really, very good. Wow, outstanding. So, but um, yeah, we've been trying, we tried to uh, do this once before and uh, couldn't figure out how to handle logistics for Chicago. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we've, we've gotten been... a little better on our, on our side too. And, and at the same time, <laughs> UPS is starting to become a little bit more reliable. The Chicago's mail system isn't that great. So I was very concerned that she would get her wine, but it worked out just fine. It showed up today, so. That's great. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for, for doing that and for getting the family involved. We loved having them. Yeah, I wish I could uh, join you on Saturday night, but I just can't. I'm going to be out of town, so. All right. Well, if you, if you do like want to join us, anybody wants to join us on Saturday, we do have about five tasting kits left. And uh, send me an email and I'll send you a discount code to make it a little easier to get you on board on Saturday as we do take the prices up as these events get closer. And um, uh, we always reward people that sign up earlier because I have to order all these wines and have them in stock and stuff like that and prepare the jars. Our team really works hard. There's a whole army here to pull this off. And uh, so it's, it's great. And thank you, uh, Michael, for, for uh, subscribing with us uh, and getting the whole family involved. Adrian, it's good to see you. Thank you. Uh, recently took a class with us at Learn About Wine. I hope you enjoyed the wine. So, did you have a favorite pick tonight? I got to I gotta unmute you, though, Adrian. I'm sorry. I can't hear you. I did just watch the movie Sound of Metal, and I'm really thinking about trying to uh, re learn how to read lips and, uh, and hand sign. But uh, I recommend the movie if you're into art flicks. It's... Um, it's a it's pretty dark and, and tough, but it's really well done. It's one of my favorite actors too. What'd you think, Adrian? Um, I'm a Chardonnay girl. It was terrific. I'm gonna get some bottles. I was asked to pick up some bottles for birthday presents. Uh, one of my bosses wants to do. I also I'm the cows. The cow wine, you know, down <laughs> on the north. I have allergies. We talked about that last yeah. time. And, you know, there's nothing better than the wine and a couple of cows. Goats, too. You know, I like goats as well. Those, but, those um, cows were spectacular beautiful, though, weren't they? I love cows. You know, you can go to places and hug cows. It's a new therapy now. I, I believe now, uh, Maybe the cows will. And they uh, seem like they were nice cows, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, so. I, I'm glad you like the Chardonnay. I, I'm going to say one more plug for that Chardonnay. This is the kind of Chardonnay you could take to a Michelin restaurant and they're going to be like, cool. Because this is a brand that, you know, high quality restaurants appreciate. They're not available in, in, in retail grocery or anything like that. So uh, it's a it's a really nice wine. And again, it's got it's got the muscle to be enjoyable now, but four or five years uh, in the cellar, no problem. Um, and uh, just really, really hardworking farmer family that uh, they, they barely wanted and, and quite honestly I had to shoot a little video with Eva 
and I'm going to send it to you when I can get it because I want you to watch it. She's so sharp, but getting them on a, on a Zoom, impossible. They're First of all, they wake up at four in the morning. Second, they, uh, they're they very shy and and don't take flattery very well. So <laughs> they just- So what uh, is our price for that wine? Well, There's I want you to look there. online. It's under 40 bucks. Okay, okay. I just want it because I'm looking at our- yeah, looking we, at our thing here we we made sure yeah when you look on the brochure there's that's the msrp pricing but okay go to the website you're going to see drastically lower prices on okay, everything right. um and then if you do uh are able to get to five bottles and use the sixer code you'll save five percent okay um, you get to 12 bottles and you save 10 percent, and that's automatic our website will only allow for one discount so uh, don't put it in a discount code if you're going to get to 12 bottles. And that's 12 of anything, by the way. We have $5 bottles of wine. Buy 11 of those and save 10% oh. on a $100 bottle of wine. And you got all those little ones uh, <laughs> for free. It's just that's how I tell people to do it. Just look for the cheap stuff. If you want to save 10%, you get those for free anyway. So um, uh, and then we are uh, delivering here in Los Angeles uh, for free uh on 50 dollar orders and then uh anywhere in california up to a case for 10 bucks so um I, it's about as aggressive okay. as we can get and we we really appreciate the business um and uh, learn about wine is just getting started um this is our second stars event we have stars of rose uh coming down the pipeline i just want to show it to you <clears throat> If I can get uh, out of here, exit full screen, and then it'll let me. There we go. So at Learn About Wine, we've been uh, working on the calendar, and then we've got our stars classes over here and events. And the stars of Rose, we're just announcing the wine brands, and we're going from Italy with Bertani great Amarone producer uh, with a, a, a really lovely Italian rosé to Los Angeles to Byron Blatty. This guy is just an absolute rock star and he's making some beautiful wines here in LA. Mm. Uh, getting a lot of press for them as well. Mm. Then over to Provence for uh, a really great bottle uh, from a top uh, importer called Up. And the glass, the packaging, and the product inside are really, really great. This is an organic producer from New Zealand. We're bringing in a New Zealand Pinot Noir Rosé. Uh, we're going out to Santa Barbara for a Morved from Tessero. And then uh, our finale wine is from Domainot Bandal. Um, and that's night one. Night two, Provence. Provence. Uh, this is a great California producer that you're going to get knocked down by. Won uh, a, a sizable competition with this wine. I tasted it. I was like, where is it from? Lodi. Get ready. Get ready. <laughs> it's probably the most expensive rosé in the lineup too. Um, but it's really, really a solid wine. We'll have Jason Haas on the Zoom from Tablas Creek. We'll go down out, out to Spain for a Rioja from, uh, well, a Rioja from Spain, and then back to France for Chateau de Acaria. This is Tavel Rosé from the Rhone, right below Chateau Neuf de Pop, the age-worthy rosé. Uh, spends time in large wood cask and gets this really dense texture and color. Uh, so quite a world of rosé that we're going to explore. You could do the two night kit for 59 bucks, or you could do the bottle, well, six bottles for $95. And let me tell you that each night is worth about $150 retail. So a really strong value proposition. We've got the one bottle night or the two bottle night. If you're into rosé at all, or even if you might not know, just do the tasting kit. And at 59 bucks, you're gonna get them both. Um, and you can taste them all and see what you like. But uh, the bottle kit is a singing deal. And if you own Coravin, and we do have a Coravin membership where you can join us and get a Coravin unit, um, this, 
almost all the bottles. Maybe there's one or two that have a screw cap. So what do you do? Corvin created a screw cap closure. You put it on the bottle, you send the Corvin through there, and it fills the bottle with the gas and it protects the wine for weeks. And so um, it's really a great way to increase the, the type of the quality of wine in your life and not force you to drink too much quantity. Um, of course, you know, it's always nice when you have the time, but not every day do you have the time. So, uh, uh, and the next day I worry about as well. But we, uh, we're, we're having fun with these STARS events. We hope you are. And uh, we hope that you'll tell your friends and get your family involved. The world's opening up. So this was our first time selling an event into the opening. Um, and I'm sure it'll even get more challenging for us uh, to entertain on Zoom. But I hope that you like this format and being able to taste at home. We're gonna continue until the end of the year. We've got an aggressive calendar. And so count on us and uh, come and visit us at Merchant of Wine and keep us busy, okay? Thank you very much, everybody. We hope you had a great time and we'll see Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank, Cheers. You. Thank you very much. Thank you.